from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So, good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. And I'm Mary Jane Deep, Chief of the African Middle East Division. And I would like to welcome you all uh, to our reading room, to our division, and to this very special program that we're hosting today. Uh, as many of, uh, of you know, we have uh, a division that has three sections, the Hebraic section, the Near East section, and the African section, we cover 78 countries. And our collections are uh, in the vernacular, the ones that we're custodian of, but of course, uh, the collections that cover the countries, our 78 countries, can be found all over the library, whether it's in the map division, whether it's in the law library, whether it's in the um, uh, general collection, of course, in, foreign, in, in uh, uh, Western languages. But you will find that uh, our division uh, also uh, attempts not only uh, to collect and to serve the collections, but also to bring uh, many of the people who have done research and used our materials and written about uh, the countries to come and talk about their work and their research and uh, in order to enlighten us all about the regions, the countries, the subjects that they cover. And today is a case in point. I'm absolutely delighted that we have Dr. Mehdi Amin Razavi here, who is a professor of philosophy and religion at the University of uh, Mary Washington, who will be talking about his book, The Wine of Wisdom. And the book is going to be available for purchase uh, later, and he has kindly agreed to sign the books. So, um, I would like now to have a Persian reference librarian um, who is doing all kinds of very exciting projects here in this division um, introduce the speaker. So, Hirad Dinavari. Thank you very much, Mary Jane. Um, truly, thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, it's at the middle of the day. I realize it's not easy to get to us, especially to the folks who've come from far away. Uh, Dr. M. Razavi himself, who's driven from uh, Fredericksburg, which is quite a distance away. Um, uh, Mehdi Amin Razavi was born in 1957 in the city of Mashhad in Iran. Following the completion of his high school, he came to the U.S. Uh, in 1976, uh, where he attended uh, the University of Washington in Seattle. Having uh, earned his bachelor's degree in urban planning and philosophy, um, his master's degree in philosophy, he continued his graduate work at Temple University in Philadelphia, where he received his master's degree in comparative religion and a doctorate uh, in philosophy of religion. Um, Dr. Amin Razavi's uh, area of specializations are Islamic studies, Islamic philosophy, theology, and mysticism, philosophy of religion, and uh, medieval philosophy. Uh, Dr. Amin Razavi has published over 12 books and 50 articles. Among his major works, uh, we can mention Sohre Vardi and the School of Illumination, The Islamic Intellectual Tradition in Persia, The Wine of Wisdom, The Life and Poetry and Philosophy of Omar Khayyam, uh, Islamic Philosophy and Theology, a textbook reader in two volumes, and a five-volume work entitled An Anthology of Philosophy in Persia, co-edited with Said Hossein Nasr, which we all know at George Washington University. He is currently a professor of philosophy and religion, director of the Middle Eastern Studies Program, and co-director of the Lediker Center for Asian Studies at the University of Mary Washington. Without taking more time, I'm going to ask Dr. Amin Razavi to come up here and take over. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. First and foremost, let me uh, thank the Library of Congress, uh, our uh, 
dear friend, Mr. Dean Avery and uh, Mary Jane and all the uh, guests who uh, took the time to um, come to Washington. It's not easy to get here, to park here, and to be here, uh, speaking from experience. So I'm grateful to you all, uh, lovers of Omar Khayyam. Um, it was, uh, this, this room brings back a great deal of memory. It was actually here that uh, I first was uh, inspired by, uh, uh, by the idea of doing, is this, by doing uh, a work on Omar Khayyam. Um, in my uh, brief remarks, I think uh, we, I have about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll leave 15, 20 minutes for uh, Q&A session. Uh, I'm going to devote just a few minutes to uh, the life and works of Omar Khayyam. That's, by and large, is uh, part of uh, public knowledge. You can easily access that, so I won't put much emphasis on it. But something has to be said about the uh, remarkable life of this man. Um, and then I'll uh, address uh, the, the, the central question which I have tried to unravel and unearth in this book. Uh, I was sitting here many, many years ago when, uh, in the beginning stages of this book when I realized that there are 11,000 books on Omar Khayyam. And so who would want to write yet another book on the subject matter? And that's in all languages in the world. So uh, I was prompted by a particular um, uh, riddle, uh, as it were, uh, and, and my investigation into that led to um, other discoveries, and that was the fundamental uh, irony or contradiction that exists between the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and his less known philosophical works, and I'll address that. In the Rubaiyat, we read uh, 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 the work of a poet who is uh, uh, stoic, who appears to be um, uh, promoting wine and love and sex and uh, sort of a, a, a carpe diem attitude. And then when you, write, when you read his philosophical works, they are very, very serious. He writes from the perspective of a Muslim philosopher. And so naturally, one tends to ask the question of how do we account for this contradiction? Uh, I'll come to that, but first and foremost, um, Omar Khayyam was uh, born and raised about an hour and a half from where I was born and raised. Uh, he is from the city of Neshabur in northeastern part of Iran, and I'm from the city of Mashhad. And as a child, we used to make numerous trips to his beautiful mausoleum, and I still remember uh, the, the beautiful Rubaiyat, which, uh, uh, which would be recited in the Khorasani, old Khorasani accent. Uh, Omar Khayyam was born in uh, the 11th century. He uh, was born in the city of Neshabur. The word Khayyam means tent maker. His father in all likelihood was a tent maker. And uh, uh, just to say uh, one particular uh, uh, incredible uh, issue about his, his early life, Omar Khayyam was about five and a half years old when he asked his father uh, to let him go to school. He wanted to study, and the father said, we are a poor family, we can't afford it. Uh, you are the son of a tent maker, you, sh you will be continuing that tradition. And so Omar insisted, and finally he takes him to the local imam of the mosque and says, my son wants to study, uh, study, become literate. And he, with a condescending attitude, says, what do you know about, uh, about knowledge, about reading, writing, what, what, why do you need it? And so he says, I know a great deal about it. I know the Quran, for example. The Imam uh, laughs at him and says, what do you know about him, about the Quran? Uh, read something. And he says, why don't you tell me which verse from which chapter you want me to read, and I will do so. So the Imam, who thought he was joking, says such and such a uh, verse from such and such chapter, and the young Omar uh, recites it and another verse, and another verse, and another verse, and the Imam is said to have fainted. Uh, when he recovers, he says, who is this child? Where does he come from? How did you learn this? And Omar says, it's very simple. My father has been taking me to the mosque since I was a, a very, very young boy, two, three years old, and I listened 
to the reciting of the Quran and I memorized it. He had in incredible memory, a memory that uh, served him well for the rest of his life. Omar Khayyam uh, goes through several teachers, usually lasting about two years. At the end of every two, three years, the teacher asks his father, tells his father that there's nothing else I can teach this child, take him somewhere else. And so he goes up and up and up, and finally he is uh, uh, allowed to sit and benefit from the same tutors that the children of nobility at the court were uh, benefiting because of his outstanding uh, intellect. Um, Omar Khayyam is now 16 years old. He says there was nothing else to read in Khorasan, uh, at least in, in Neshawur area. He travels, he goes to Harat, uh, benefits from a library, comes back to Neshawur, and then he makes a series of trips, which I'm going to uh, just summarize. He goes to uh, the city of Ray, near today's Tehran. Uh, he goes to Esfahan, where he meets with Nizam al-Mulk, the Grand Vizier and uh, Chamberlain of the Seljuk Empire. Uh, he uh, is asked to stay at the court and become uh, a court philosopher, scientist. He refuses to do that. Uh, then he is offered to become the governor of Khorasan. He refuses that as well. Then he is asked to become the chief judge of, uh, of Khorasan. Uh, which he refuses again. He says, in that capacity, I will have to pass sentences of all kinds, harsh sentences, and I'm not the type of person. This also bears testament to the fact that uh, Omar Khayyam was, uh, was well-versed in fiqh, or jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence. He was not the anti-religious person which uh, so, so many people have made him to be. Uh, he is referred to uh, by Hujatul Islam, Saqatul Islam, um, and, and all sorts of religious titles, which means he was well versed in religious sciences as well. So they asked him, what do you want? And uh, Omar was intelligent enough to say, give me a stipend so I can be a scholar and devote the rest of my life uh, in scholarship. He uh, goes back to Neshabur, they grant him a an apple orchard, uh, a beautiful one apparently, in, uh, in a town, in a village near uh, Neshabur by the name Shad Yach, which was leveled during Mongols. About 10 years ago, uh, the Iranian government began to excavate that. I personally visited the area that was excavated. It's about the size of this hall, maybe even a little less. And you, you see uh, homes and reminiscent of uh, pots uh, which um, Omar Khayyam liked to use as an imagery. Um, Omar Khayyam lives to be a very old man. We don't know exactly when he died, but uh, in one of his poems he says, uh, I am 72 years old and I have learned that I, I have come to know that I know nothing. Uh, the famous Socratic uh, uh, quote. So, um, let me move on from his, uh, his life, which uh, was both remarkable in the scientific sense, but not particularly eventful. Um, uh, and then uh, comes uh, the, the major issue, uh, and, and that is Omar Khayyam's writings. He writes 11 or 12 books, depending on how we divide them. One of them is Hagiographic. Uh, it's not his, uh, a treatise on the reality of Nowruz which is filled with mistakes. Uh, it is definitely not his. Probably one of his students wrote it. And it talks about uh, Zoroastrian rituals and so on. It is entirely possible that Omar Khayyam's father was, uh, was a Zoroastrian and Omar Khayyam is, was a convert. But uh, we, we do know that he knew some Pahlavi um, that also he employed later on in the convening of the calendar. How much, we don't know, uh, but, but uh, probably some. Um, Omar Khayyam writes five, uh, five of his treatises are on mathematics, algebra, non-Euclidean geometry, uh, calculus, uh, he invents uh, a, geometric, a geometrical way of solving uh, problems of calculus, which is unique to him. And so there are purely scientific. There is uh, uh, 
you know, nothing philosophical about that. Then five of his, uh, uh, his works, uh, treatises, are uh, philosophical in nature. And they treat a variety of philosophical questions from the question of existence, being, essence, accident, traditional Aristotelian problems, commentaries on, the, uh, on emanation, and he has one treatise on the existence of proof on the existence of God, and one treatise on the problem of theodicy or the problem of evil. All of them are written in Arabic except one, and, um, and, and they uh, are very, very much written in the style of Avicenna or Ibn Sina. Um, he tells us uh, that he considers himself to be a student of Avicenna. Uh, Time-wise, it's, po it's not possible. He uh, must have lived an extra 33 years if he were to be a student of uh, Avicenna, but in all likelihood, he was a student of the student, of, of the best student of Avicenna, who was Bahmanyar. Um, and several of his biographers have alluded to that. Now, uh, when I was, uh, w w when I checked out uh, his, uh, uh, a single volume uh, from Mr. Purhadi, who is no longer here, and uh, th these were unedited, they were uh, not very legible. These five philosophical treatises are very, very brief. Omar Khayyam wrote very, very brief. He did not uh, like to lecture publicly. He did not uh, like to accept students. They told him that uh, he was uh, um, an old grumpy man um, who did not like to share his knowledge with others. There are reasons for that, and I'll, I'll allude to that. Uh, he, he partially explains that. Um, let me read uh, why I think he was reluctant to share his knowledge with others. I won't read too many of these poems in Persian. I know some of you are Persian speakers, but uh, uh, a couple of them I do, but I'll, I'll translate it. Asrar jahan chanan ke dar daftar maast, guftan natawan kaan vabal سر ماست چون نیست در این مردم نادان امنی نتوان گفتن هر آنچه در خاطر ماست The secrets which my book of love has bred cannot be told for fear of loss of head Since none is fit to learn or cares to know it's better all my thoughts remain unsaid He kept a very very private um, uh, number of students around him, five uh, all in all, um, and I'll, I'll uh, explain wh uh, why he uh, liked his secrecy so much. So now we come to the real heart and soul of my book, and that is um, the number of rubaiyat, the quatrains, that are uh, considered to be authentic. This, there's, a, there's a major problem on the question of authenticity of Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat, which I have not dealt extensively in this book because part of the 11,000 books that have been written on him in the last two centuries have dealt with that. It's a lit question for, uh, for, for masters of literature. But the number of authentic literature are, uh, are, are uh, uh, estimated to be anywhere from 12 to 72, even though uh, um, uh, a Hindu scholar by the name Govinda uh, Tirtahe has gathered 1,300 of these rubaiyats which he attributes to him, but they are they're most definitely not authentic. These rubaiyats, when you read them, they question uh, almost every facet of religion. F uh, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to say questions the existence of God, but pokes at God. How can God's justice, God's fairness, uh, dictums of God, uh, religion, tenets of faith, hell, heaven, he really loves to poke fun of hell and heaven, the huris, the, uh, you know, all the virgins that are waiting for us, and so on and so forth. So, so there is a systematic uh, I, I call it sarcastic deconstructionism of 
religion through his rubaiyat. And what, whether we take the 12, 12 authentic ones or the 12, 1300 uh, unauthentic ones, there is a family resemblance amongst all of them. And that is a criticism of the central tenets of, of Islam. He does not question the existence of God, but he does question God's justice. Now, then we shift to this other uh, uh, lit literary genre, the philosophical genre. We read, we read them. Uh, they are very brief. The shortest one is about three and a half page. The longest one is 12. And when you read them, they all begin with uh, uh, the standard way that Muslim philosophers uh, begin a treatise is, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, most merciful, most compassionate. He uses several uh, Quranic uh, verses in them, and then at the end he offers his praise to Prophet Muhammad, and it ends. So if you didn't know, it's Omar Khayyam who has written this. You think this is uh, Avicenna, Farabi, uh, one of the later philosophers, Al-Ghazali, and so on. So how do we reconcile this discrepancy, right? There is, he, he was speaking with two hats. There is almost intellectual schizophrenia, and uh, there must be some, some way to explain this. There is one theory uh, proposed many years ago by uh, Professor Mohit Tabatawai, who proposed the, the idea of several Omar Khayyams. Uh, he is right, there were four uh, men living at the same time by the name Khayyam or Khayyami, and one of them was a poet, and it's, so one theory says that Omar Khayyam never wrote these rubais. That, that's one. The second one says that uh, he, he wrote them, but he didn't pub publicize them for, as he said, the fear of losing his head. Um, but I, I have uh, come up with a different theory which explains uh, how to account for the discrepancy, for the irony, for the, for the outright contradiction in the writings of one person. All right, uh, for, for that, I became a, a student of history for a while and uh, read the uh, uh, socio-political context of his time. Omar Khayyam's time was very much, I, 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 I neither want to politicize uh, this lecture, uh, nor is this the place for it, but there are a great deal of analogies between uh, Omar Khayyam's time, the time in which he lived, and what is happening in his and my native land of Iran. Uh, the, uh, the period is 12th century. Um, Saljuks, uh, Saljuk Turks have, uh, uh, are ruling Iran. Nothing wrong with being Turks, but it becomes a problem if you're trying to rule Persians. And so these are Turkish uh, tribes from Central Asia who are ruling over over Persia, and they, to justify and co consolidate their position, they need the backing of the orthodox elements. If you lived in the first four centuries of, of the Islamic calendar, uh, the word philosophy, theology, intellectual sciences was a highly praised uh, 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 phrase or concept. Uh, people like Farabi, like Ibn Sina, uh, uh, some of the early theologians, Mu'tazilites, Asharites, they were all uh, highly respected. And then comes the fifth and sixth century in which we have a complete shift, shift of intellectual paradigm. Now the fundamentalists take over. With the coming of the Saljuk, the, the orthodox Sunni Saljuks, in particular when the Islamic empire was uh, entering into a, a survival mode uh, against the Crusades, uh, intellectual sciences became a ba bad word. I have always analogized that the Crusade, the impact of Crusade on, on the Islamic world was like 9-11 on America. After 9-11, all the fuzzy-headed intellectuals were pushed aside and the generals and hardliners, rightly so, came to the forefront. And so at the time when Malik Shah and the Saljuk Empire wanted to not only consolidate its position uh, in Persia and its, uh, its uh, 
territory in its empire, but also had a big fight with, with the crusade, uh, intellect, philosophers, theologians, people who, ca who said, let's sit around and talk about these issues, they sort of uh, were moved aside. In fact, being a philosopher was a bad word. Um, uh, Omar Khayyam was accused of being a philosopher, right? Two centuries later, he would have been rewarded by, by the king for that. And he has to defend himself. In Arubai, he says, a philosopher I am, opponents erroneously say, God knows I am not who they say. While I am in this sorrow-laden nest, I know not who and why I am, nor why I should stay. So um, they furthermore uh, issue a fatwa and a religious edict against him to prove that he's a good Muslim. He goes to Mecca and he comes back. So that gives him certain degree of, of immunity. Um, so Omar Khayyam, a mathematician, astronomer, rationalist, philosopher, who appreciated the rationalistic legacy and tradition of the Islamic civilization, the, the legacy that brought Islam to its golden era, right? Uh, from Andalusia all the way to Persia, from the chemistry of Jabir ibn Hayyan to the mathematics of Khwarazmi to uh, uh, medical discoveries of of Avicenna and so on, it was all accomplished. Civilizations thrive if or when there are rational people in charge of it. And Omar Khayyam was witnessing, witnessing the, the decline of rationalism throughout the Islamic world. He was angry. Uh, in fact, there, they were, they were um, um, I, uh, what I did, one of the things I found which was in, incredibly exciting were to uh, ha have found all the fatwas, all the edicts which uh, conservative clerics had issued against all sorts of things. Um, um, mathematics, uh, astronomy, uh, even medicine was considered to be meddling in the affairs of God. There was, uh, if, I can, if I can find that, uh, uh, there is, uh, e they even came with a, uh, uh, so Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, one of the major jurists, said philosophers are heretics. Uh, Musa Nobahdi, another major uh, uh, jurist, uh, uh, rejected logic and astronomy. Uh, Al-Ghazali, the famous Al-Ghazali, in the first chapter of the famous al the reconstruction of religious sciences, uh, rejected uh, mathematics uh, and geometry and said from, from all that, uh, enough is permissible to calculate religious taxes. The rest are not necessary. And they came up even with a hadith, a saying of Prophet Muhammad, which allegedly has said the following. In medicine, there is no medicine, there is no benefit. In geometry, there is no truth. Natural sciences are heretical and those believe in such are heretics. This is not, not a hadith, uh, not, not an authentic hadith. So Omar Khayyam is living at a time which the dark ages of the Islamic civilization is beginning. He is upset, he is angry, and on one hand, if he were to write about it, he would lose his head. On the other hand, as a, a respectable uh, intellectual, he can't stand by and let the ultra-right dictate and drag the Islamic civilization to its dark ages. He decides to follow a two-track policy, uh, which was the only thing he could have done. There, oh, here is a glass of water. He tries to defend rationalism, and by doing so, tries to uh, revive the tradition, the, the peripatetics or mashais, the Muslim Aristotelians. Uh, so philosophically, he writes in that tradition. He defends logic, he defends rationalism, he defends Avicenna, Farabi, he defends the first master, 
being Aristotle, and he does so in a very, very uh, condensed but uh, uh, skillful way. And so he, he can get away with that. Philosophy was, was uh, looked down upon, but still you could get away with it. But then, what about, what about um, criticizing other aspects of the Dark Ages, uh, which was falling or befalling upon the Islamic Empire? Uh, well, he couldn't write about it. He would have been killed. He couldn't have talked about it. And so, on one hand, he lived a semi-hermetic life, uh, which shielded him from the, the, the public, and I'll uh, say a few words about that. And then on the sec second uh, uh, mode of communication, second venue he adopted, came poetry. Poetry. Poetry which he in all likelihood composed and recited to his students, but did not write them. And his students uh, in all likelihood wrote it. Uh, also, teaching, it, it, it's, a, it's a traditional Persian way of teaching that uh, professors, masters who walk into a classroom, they often use poetry. Poetry to Persian, traditional Persian culture is like, uh, you know, baseball to American culture. You just, uh, at one time or another, you have to uh, get involved and so use it. Uh, and, and so our teachers from K through 12 always would throw a few uh, poems to address this and that issue. So Omar Khayyam, first of all, used quatrains, rubayat, which is the shortest version of Persian poetry. It consists of four stanzas, four parts. It's designed to deliver a message, kind of a, in a punch, punch a, uh, message in go, wh whereas other forms, qasida, qazal, these are much, much longer. You can't just uh, sort of uh, uh, touch and go, so to speak. So he chooses the shortest version of it, and he begins to treat uh, issues that uh, were of concern to the two intellectual camps at the time. Uh, in the 12th century, we had a major, major debate between the fundamentalists and the modernists, exactly the kind of discourse we have in just about every Islamic country in the world. Um, you know, the, in Egypt we have, we have Ikhwan al-Muslimin who came to power and there are d demonstrations for them, there are demonstrations against them. So the two intellectual uh, uh, paradigm at the time of Omar Khayyam were Mu'tazilites, the Muslim rationalists, and Ash'arites who, who were the faith-based theologians. Now, faith, Faith-based theologians, Ash'arites, had the upper hand. In fact, the largest center of Ash'arite learning was just about a few hundred feet, literally, from where Omar Khayyam lived and died. The greatest master of them, two of the greatest master of them, one was uh, Juvaini, known as Imam al-Haramain, and the other one, the famous al-Ghazali, were both living you know, within a, 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 a few hundred feet from uh, Omar Khayyam. But ironically, neither Omar Khayyam knew any of them, nor uh, any, of, any of the masters knew Omar Khayyam. At least biographers have said nothing about them. Giovanni had a major, major school. It said that he had several hundred students, all of whom were very, very orthodox uh, theologians. And yet, Omar Khayyam managed to live in the shadow of orthodoxy without having been harassed by them. So you have to, uh, you, you have to uh, lay low, you have to remain aloof, you have to write w in very, very cryptic way, which his philosophical writings are. And then the best thing to do if, if you want to criticize religion uh, do it in a poetic form and not write it down in the oral tradition. And that's precisely how Rubaiyat came to be. I'm going to read a few of these uh, so, so you get a taste for, for uh, his criticisms. Uh, and these are not, uh, 
not random. Uh, these are questions which were being debated publicly between the, the rationalists and uh, the fundamentalists. One of the questions was the question of certainty. Uh, a Muslim who is not certain of the truth of religion will go to hell. And so Khayyam says, چون نیست حقیقت و یقینا در دست نتوان با امید شک همه عم نشست هان تا ننهیم جامعه از کف دست در بی خبری مرد چه هوشیار و چه مست ye do not grasp the truth but ye grow why waste in life and sit in doubtful hope be aware and hold forever holy name from trooper saying or sought in death will slope. Right? So one of the things I did in this book was to found all the intellectual matter, all the intellectual issues which matter to both sides. If you make a list of them. Uh, and then I, I, I um, made a list of all the authentic uh, quatrains, rubais, and then try to match them. Incredibly, they actually came together. Omar Khayyam was responding through poetry to specific uh, issues of concern be between the two camps, so to speak. He, by today's standard, would be a modernist, a rationalist, who was trying to respond, at least poetically, rationally, to uh, issues of, of, of uh, contention between, between the two. So, of course, there is the question of life after death, one of the central issues that a Muslim must accept uh, on the basis of faith is the existence of paradise and hell and so on and so forth. And on that, Omar Khayyam has roughly about 20 authentic verses and several inauthentic ones who uh, mocks this concept. Um, and on, the pious people would advise that as we die, we rise up fools or wise. It's for this cause we keep with lover and wine. For in the end, would same we hope to rise. In another one he says, in paradise are angels as men throw and fountains with pure wine and honey flow. If these be lawful in the world to come, may I not love the like down here below? Right? So we see, we see uh, a large number of, of, of uh, poems that goes through uh, the Asherite, uh, sort of uh, uh, the heart of Asherite, thinking and tries to tear him apart. Um, there, is the, there is the question of, uh, of uh, God created us and there is a purpose for that. And of course, um, you know, there is, a, there is an end in sight and so on on the other side. To which he says, oh, unenlightened race of humankind, ye are a nothing built on empty wind. Ye a mere nothing hovering in the abyss, a void before you, and a void behind, and so on. I, we don't have time for me to go through all of them. But uh, uh, my humble contribution to Khayyamian studies as, as we are approaching uh, to quarter to 12, uh, we have 45 minutes, is that correct? Right, I want to stick to, to the time frame. My humble con contribution to Khayyamian studies uh, has been to, uh, to unlock uh, the mystery of the Rubaiyat be above and beyond their beauty. Traditionally, the Rubaiyat, especially uh, Fitzgerald's uh, translation, is read not only for its uh, ingenious translation, the beauty of the language, but also it addresses human condition, the problems that all humans universally experience pain and joy and fear and death and so on. So that, of course, is there. There, there are enduring questions with which Omar Khayyam 
has, uh, has wrestled with. But there is also a sociopolitical context which, uh, uh, which Hitretro has, has been neglected. Namely, Omar Khayyam did not get up one day and say, why didn't I write poetry? Uh, there were reasons. There were social reasons, political reasons, uh, closing of, of, of the Islamic mind, as it were, the collapsing of the empire, uh, the beginning of the Dark Ages, the decline of rationalism. And so this was Omar Khayyam's way of, of uh, defending uh, the legacy, uh, the, the, the golden ages of the Islamic empire, that with which Islam uh, was turned from the religion of Bedouins into an empire which thrived, as you all know, in the Andalusia, uh, produced some of the, some of the uh, most ex exquisite examples of art and literature and philosophy and so on. In two minutes, I want to talk about uh, a chapter of my uh, book, which ended up being the largest chapter, and I didn't expect it at all. Uh, and hopefully that will become a book unto itself. Uh, and that was uh, the impact of Omar Khayyam in the West. I was aware of Omar Khayyam Club of London. And so I began to do some reading about, about uh, Omar Khayyam Club of London, but then I so soon I realized that uh, 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 not too far uh, uh, after its, uh, its formation, uh, right around 1832, Omar Khayyam Club came to America. It went to New England. It was uh, established in Youngtown, uh, Massachusetts. And then a large number of uh, Omarian poets began to pop up everywhere in the country, and a literary genre, a poetic genre, began to take place in America known as Omarians. So we had Omarian club actually in Georgetown, which I couldn't find anymore, uh, in Ohio, here and there. And Omar Khayyam was embraced by the likes of Emerson, uh, New England transcendentalists. I'm doing a book on that called Persian Sufism and American Literary Masters, which actually will be published next year by Sunni Press. And so uh, Omar Khayyam became the champion of humanism in North America and was labeled as the Antichrist in the South. Uh, I have lots and lots of notes, which I want to turn that into a book called Omar Khayyam in America. Uh, and that will be uh, uh, a lecture for five years from now. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Amin Razavi. I uh, want to uh, thank uh, everyone again for being here. If you have questions, feel free to ask, but just be um, cognizant of the fact that by speaking, you're giving us permission to tape you and then subsequently webcast uh, your questions. So essentially, you're consenting. And I uh, asked Dr. Razavi by, um, for him to repeat the questions since we don't have microphones back there. Thank you very much. Yes, let's. Um, he addresses some of the core existential issues that deals with human condition uh, in a universal sense of the word. All humans uh, ask the fundamental questions. Why am I here? Where am I going? What is the purpose of life? And then there is a, uh, a, a, a fundamental irony between uh, what I call uh, the transcendental and the eminent. Uh, it is one thing to write a philosophical treatises and uh, justify the existence of pain and suffering in the world as medieval philosophers did. It's another thing if you have a horrible toothache. And so um, Omar Khayyam was well aware of this inconsistency. On one hand, he looks around and he sees pain, he sees suffering, he sees death. Uh, uh, northern part of Khorasan 
was an area which was uh, not only it's on the seismic belt and had experienced uh, major, major earthquakes, but also lots of tribes from the north, from Central Asia had come and uh, massacred uh, so on. So, so Omar Khayyam was addressing the question of temporality of life, of suffering, evil, and then uh, how do we reconcile that with the existence of a God? And in that sense, I think, uh, and, 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 the, and then, of course, uh, Fitzgerald's ingenious translation, which is not a translation, he says it's a rendition. He himself says it's a rendition. And his Persian was actually very poor, but, but he captured the essence of it, just absolutely uh, beautiful. Go ahead, to, and then you. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Yes, yes. Yes. There, what do we know about his relation or was there any relation with the scholars of Dara um, We don't know very much about that. When he went to Mecca to prove that he was pious, and then he went to Baghdad. In Baghdad, we know that he met with a number of scholars. And in Baghdad at the time, there was a school of thought called uh, uh, Eastern Abyssinians, Eastern Abyssinians. I'm actually working on a translation of uh, al mantaq al uh, The Logic of the Easterners by Ibn Sina with my colleague, Professor Shukri uh, Abed, uh, which deals with that. We, we know that Omar Khayyam met with scholars in Baghdad, uh, with people from Beit al-Hikmah, as, as you said. Uh, and then a group of Sufis came uh, who, uh, who considered him to be a Sufi master, and he, he refused to accept that he had anything to do with Sufism, and so he left. So that's the extent of what we know by way of speculation and conjecture. We can't really uh, name names, as in the case of others. Yes? Right. Thank you for answering that Sh already. Sure. The second is, in today's Iran, is he allowed to be published in the past? That's a very good question. At, at the end of my own book, I, I was daring enough to say that it, it is ironic that some 800 years ago, a man was able to write just about everything he wanted about religion, or at least, you know, poetically, and live to be 80, 90 years old. And I've, I've said this explicitly, if Omar Khayyam were to have lived in Iran today, he definitely would be in Evan prison for life. Uh, so the answer to your question is no. Uh, I, I, I think uh, the Ash'arite discourse, the fundamentalist discourse, against whom Omar Khayyam 800 years ago uh, fought, have unfortunately won for the time being. Uh, just to add one more thing about Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald, as you know, uh, his, his engagement, I didn't repeat it again, did I? Uh, okay. uh, Fitzgerald's engagement with, with uh, the Rubaiyat was not just a literary interest, it was an obsession. Uh, it, he went through five different versions of it. And so each one uh, about six, seven years ago. And when you compare them, you will see that he has moved replaced an and with with, and has put a comma here, a comma there. The fifth version actually was in a coffee cup next to his bed when they found him dead. And so, uh, I, 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 and the, the, the changes were so, so, so minuscule and pedantic that it just ma makes you wonder. But, but uh, Fitzgerald himself said that uh, 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 these are not translations of the Rubaiyat. These are renditions of uh, uh, his poetry and poetic inspirations. I'm quoting him verbatim. Uh, uh, poetic inspirations from one poet to another. They are like bubbles 
that come from the depth of my being to the surface and pop, and then I write them. So, um, so they're not very truthful to the origin, to the original text, but from all the translations that I had time to review, none, none uh, come close to capturing the essence of what he said. The only problem is, is when he was being read was uh, Victorian period, uh, Victorian Romanticism, and so Omar Khayyam really doesn't mean, you know, live it up and uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll and so on. There's a great deal of symbolism there. Yes. Uh, the, the, the question was, uh, since uh, Omar Khayyam lived a solitary life and did not accept uh, administrative positions, what, what was uh, his purpose uh, in life? I, I think his purpose in life was, uh, you know, to, uh, in today's standards, you know, in academia, as we say, publish or perish. Uh, he didn't have that problem because the Sultan had, uh, uh, Malik Shah Saljuri had, uh, 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 given him 10,000 dinar a, a year. And uh, so he, he, I, I, I think Omar Khayyam knew his own, the power of his own intellect. He knew his own worth. And he knew that if he were to become involved in administrative position, politics, and so on, that talent would be wasted. Imagine if Albert Einstein became, you know, assistant secretary of state. Uh, I'm not quite sure if he would have had what we have of him. So very, he made the same choice that, that Einstein made. He lived a semi-hermetic life in the corner of some laboratory in Princeton, and Omar Khayyam knew that what he's capable of doing, and so he wrote. He wrote extensively. He did research. Uh, he made the most accurate calendar that has ever been made, uh, far more accurate than the Gregorian calendar of the West uh, at the order of the king. And so he, he made tremendous amount of work. Uh, unfortunately, when Mongols uh, attacked, and when I went to Shadiyah, uh, not as part of the excavating team, but as a sort of observer, and, and, and a friend of mine and I made a documentary uh, on Omar Khayyam called uh, uh, the, the, the uh, intoxicating rhymes and sobering wine. Uh, when, when we went there, it, uh, the Mongols had flattened, just literally just flattened anything that, that uh, was on the ground. And so uh, it is entirely possible that some of his works may be uh, unearthed at some point. Uh, but, uh, but, but he was a scholar all the, all the way, a genius who Yes. That's the thorniest question one can ask about Omar Khayyam. Oh, okay. So <laughs> si since we don't have the original manuscript written by Omar Khayyam, um, how authentic are they? How close are they to the original? The, the, the real, real answer is we don't know. The earliest one, the earliest one, ones appear 85 years after his death. And so... Um, and then within the next 35 years after that, we have another 60 to 70 uh, of the Rubaiyat uh, appearing here and there. And then, uh, ironically, they show up in, in two different, from two different venues, those who liked him and spoke well of him and those who called him a heretic. Someone like Shamsa Tabrizi, the, 
the famous teacher of uh, Rumi, absolutely hated him. He said, he, this man was lost. He had no idea what he was talking about. Had he seen the truth, he wouldn't have been saying this. But then he, he is repeating something that someone else said. So, so all, all his rubayat came within about 85 years or so. And then they start growing. That's correct, yes, yes. That, that is survived. That, that has survived and in fact is one of, one of the, it, it, for, for centuries he was known in the West as a mathematician, not a philosopher uh, and, and, and uh, since 18th century as a poet. Uh, his mathematical writings uh, have survived. There are a number of American uh, mathematicians who have written on him but there is an entire school of Hayamian mathematics in Russia by Russian mathematicians who's, who, uh, who, who have stressed the non-Euclidean nature of his approach. Yes, yes, exactly, yes, yes. Uh, Professor uh, Moezi, who taught mathematics at University of Texas, has done some work on that. Yeah. The Iranian government uh, has a love-hate relationship with a number of figures like Khayyam, beginning with the, the, uh, Ferdowsi, who is the, the, the uh, uh, father of uh, Persian mythology and epic literature, Omar Khayyam, even Sufism and so on, uh, depending on the internal politics of it. On one hand, they cannot ignore uh, the major achievements of, of people like him. But on the other hand, uh, if, if you take it at its face value, well, you know, it goes contrary to the government's version of Islam, at least. And so, they're, so they, have, uh, they have this love-hate relationship, um, yeah, at, at best. That's correct. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but his 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 poetry was was just critical of you know uh, of orthodoxy, and so it didn't matter. There's another. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.